my weekly exercise. Actually, I got a lot more exercise than that when I was in China. <laughs> Every day, riding a bicycle several miles just to get to the school where Ed would teach, and uh, had the privilege of speaking eight different times, an hour each time to each of his eight different classes. And uh, some exciting things that we'll share with you at some point. Uh, after I get, I took 3,800 pictures. <laughs> And so we have to do a little bit of editing before I show those, but uh, hopefully in September sometime. Please take your Bibles and turn with me tonight, if you will, to Acts chapter 26, the second part of Witnessing in Court. We're looking at that chapter, verses 1 through 23. Acts chapter 26, verses 1 through 23. I'm going to summarize very briefly before we read that passage again what we looked at last week. This is part two of Witnessing in Cork. Last week we saw that the resurrection of Christ was central to the legal trial of the Apostle Paul. And it's always going to be central whenever you're dealing with a humanistic rationalist because a humanist must not believe in the resurrection or else his house of cards collapses. The resurrection destroys pagan evolutionism. We've talked about that in great detail in the past. Because the evolutionist thinks that this life is all that there is and that we're just getting better and better, but that when you're dead, you're dead. It's the roadblock that the materialist cannot get around because the resurrection shows you there's something beyond this life. It's the impending avalanche that engulfs the unbelieving climber on the mountainside. It suddenly hits him. Some of you may have seen that film years ago, Avalanche. And in that film, there's a guy who, a very cheerful, happy person, and he's standing on the edge of a cliff and he suddenly turns around and an avalanche is coming at him and it sweeps him off the cliff. The resurrection is the heart of the gospel. That's why Satan has placed blinders on unbelievers on this very critical issue. But Paul places it at the heart of the gospel, both in Romans 1, where he encapsulates the gospel, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first four verses of Romans 1, the resurrection is at the heart of the gospel. The first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection, is at the heart of the gospel. Never fail to present the resurrection when you are speaking to an unbeliever. If he's listening at all, he knows that's different. It's something that no other religion in the world offers. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the proof that the gospel is true. Everybody dies, but if you walk through a cemetery, everybody is still in the grave. Only Jesus Christ has permanently raised from the dead. Others have been resuscitated from the dead, but gone back again. It says many came out of their graves when Christ was crucified on the cross, went into the city of Jerusalem and spoke to people, but they didn't stay around. The son of the widow at Nain was raised from the dead, but he died again. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he died again. Jesus is raised from the dead no more to die. The resurrection is the heart of the gospel. Even the most hard-hearted, unbelieving, God-hating pagan won't resist the death of Christ, though he'll quibble with you about death for sin because he doesn't believe in sin. But he'll believe that Jesus died. Where he sticks is on the resurrection. So always emphasize the resurrection because a Christ who is not risen from the dead cannot save you. The Apostle Paul made that the heart of everything he did. If you read every one of Paul's sermons in the book of Acts, the resurrection is at the heart. 
if you read every one of the books that he wrote in the New Testament, it's the risen Christ who is the center of what Paul preached. If you and I would get that mindset, we would discover that every place we go, everything that we do, will always come back to a risen Christ. Jesus said at the end of his ministry, just before he ascended into heaven, ye are my witnesses. For good or for bad, we're it. We witness to Jesus, who he is, what he did. Your entire life as a Christian centers around that truth. And if it does not, it's because you are not in the will of God. God called you, he saved you, he empowered you by his Holy Spirit to be his servant proclaiming the good news. That should be at the heart of everything that every one of us does every day. We not merely live it, but we proclaim it. Even Jesus, who lived a perfect life, was forced to talk. Simply seeing it in you is good, but it's not enough. Every one of us must proclaim who Jesus is and what Jesus did. He's both God and man. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Without the risen Christ, we have no hope. We talked about the countries in which the resurrection is not permitted to be preached because it gives hope. And if people have hope for the future, they're less likely to be docile and easy to be controlled by the authorities. We talked about how many Christians have given up hope because of our current political situation. and We discussed that in great detail this morning. But we do not have to give up hope because we serve a risen Christ. We saw that the reason that the Jews were so opposed to the Apostle Paul and even before the death of Christ, how they understood that he claimed to rise from the dead. And they begged Pilate to seal the tomb so that his disciples couldn't take the body and claim he had risen from the dead. They understood the message even when the Apostles did not because it would give the people hope. We'd ask the question, how many of you would take money to deny the resurrection? How much money would it take? Suppose you are made president of the United States and, and you're, the temptation that comes to you is, you know, uh, we don't have very many good candidates out there, but if you became president, you could make a tremendous Christian impact on the United States. And I will guarantee to you that you can become the next president of the United States if you will just once deny the resurrection. That's the same kind of temptation that Satan gave to Jesus. Just yield once on any one of these points. What would you take? If you would take anything at all, you have just denied the Lord who bought you with his own blood. The resurrection is the heart of the gospel. It gives hope for the future. It's literally tied to the bodily return of Christ at the rapture and then at the second coming. That's why the rapture is called the blessed hope in the New Testament. Hope makes people unafraid to share the gospel because they know the best is yet to come. If you really believe the gospel, it means that you will talk about Jesus all the time to everybody you meet. I think some of us claim that we believe it, but we're either afraid or ashamed to talk about it because of what people will think. 
The second main thing that we noticed in our text was that pagan leaders are trying to solve a spiritual problem with carnal methods. That's impossible for them. That's impossible for us, too. We often try to solve spiritual problems with carnal methods. That's what modern psychology is all about. Instead of using the scripture to solve people's problems, they use the rational ideas of man. It's the same thing that we find Agrippa trying to do with Felix. They're trying to solve a spiritual problem with carnal methods. That, of course, is impossible, sort of like trying to get a whale to climb up Mount Everest. Festus admits in our text that he has no way to solve the problem because he had nothing to write to Caesar that would stick as a crime. And that, of course, would make him look like an idiot and not worthy of being an officer under Roman law. Paul's trial was actually a sham because there was no legal evidence that would stick in a Roman court of law, and the judges knew it. But they were playing political games with the Jews. Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying out that he ought not to live any longer. He's under pressure. Not from one or two. It says from a multitude of the Jews. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and that he himself had appealed unto Augustus, I have determined to send him of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore, I have brought him before you, and especially before you, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. <laughs> and then the understatement of the chapter, for it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. We saw several things that immediately stood out in the text. First, as I mentioned a moment ago, the pagans are trying to deal with a spiritual matter. They're trying to handle a case that rests on the resurrection of Christ. But they're not actually going to try the issue or the evidence for the issue. Because it's irrelevant to Roman law. Rising from the dead and asserting that someone has risen from the dead fails the legal test for five reasons. Number one. Rising from the dead and preaching the resurrection was not a criminal offense under Roman law. Number two, rising from the dead was a singular event. In other words, it's not a repeatable event for the sake of proof in a court. In other words, it's not subject to the scientific method. Number three, from a humanistic perspective, resurrection, the issue that the court is trying to adjudicate, is a non-issue. Number four, <laughs> and this is rather important if you're coming for a criminal trial, especially a capital crime, there was no evidence to convict Paul, even if rising from the dead or preaching about it was a capital offense. Because, you see, Jesus had already bodily ascended into heaven. There was no body, either dead or alive, to present to the court. And finally, to the contrary, Paul claimed eyewitness testimony to support his claim, including his own eyewitness account on the Damascus Road. That should have trumped everything that the Jews claimed against Paul. But we have a political court. You know, we've got some political courts today, too. You think about issues like abortion and euthanasia, and same-sex marriage, quote-unquote, and transgendered persons' issues. We have politics going on, not law, and certainly not constitutional law, as we talked about this morning. We learned five lessons. Number one, unsaved pagans will never be able to reach theological truth by legal means. Just like Jewish law can't save you, neither can secular law. Too many Christians are dependent upon whether or not we're going to be able to get the right laws passed or the right judges in. Your safety and salvation depends on Jesus, not on whether or not everything is politically okay. Number two, unsaved pagans who hear the truth clearly articulated are accountable even if they don't believe. Number three, those who hear and reject are subject to the most severe judgment, 
And we talked about the death of Bernice as a striking warning to everyone of what hell will be like. Number four, even pagans understand that it is unreasonable to make Christian theology the basis for capital punishment, but that doesn't stop them from trying to do it anyway. That's what's happening around the world today. Christians giving their lives because of their theology, because they believe in Jesus, because they believe he died for our sins, was buried and rose again, because they will not subscribe to Allah or to communism or to many other pagan isms. And finally, even the best unsaved expert can only pass the buck and not come to a fair conclusion concerning faith in Christ because it takes faith in Christ to understand. Now, Acts 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently, my manner of life from my youth. In other words, the Apostle Paul is giving some character testimony here. Character testimony, which he says could be confirmed by the very people who have put him on trial. Which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. What's he talking about? He gets to the point. What's he talking about? The hope of the fathers. What's he talking about? Where does he start after he says, look, they could testify this. They claim to believe it themselves. The hope of the fathers is the resurrection. Under which promise are twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought an incredible thing with you that God should raise the dead? You know, folks, someday I suspect that either I, or if I am dead, you, will be put on trial. You know where you ought to go first? Who Jesus is and what he did. You don't know who's listening in that court. You don't know how long you'll get to speak. You don't know whether or not you'll be killed before you have an opportunity to share Christ. The first place you go is Jesus. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There may be somebody there in that courtroom that day that won't be there the next day, even if you get brought back a second time. Go to Christ. Speak of Christ. Exalt Christ. Because after all, if you're in that situation, he's the only one who can save you anyway. Point to Jesus. Witnessing in court. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing also I did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison. You don't know if there's somebody listening to you on the day that you speak that will be like Paul. One who had betrayed Christians, one who had arrested Christians, one who voted against Christians, when the vote of the Sanhedrin was cast, someone whose heart God can change. Do you believe this, folks? Do you believe that God can change hearts? Do you live like you believe it? If you believe it, do you believe that God could use you to be the witness who shares Jesus 
with somebody outside the four walls of the church. Not merely those whom we drag here or entice here, but those with whom you come in contact every day. Do you believe it? If you do, do you share Jesus? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do you point people to Jesus outside the context of this piece of property? I hope you do. Go ye into all the church property and preach the gospel unto every creature. Is that what it says? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How limited our thinking has become. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, the voice knocked them flat. The others didn't understand it. They heard, and Paul explains this later on, they heard it but they didn't understand it. He's the only one who understood it. They heard a sound, but they didn't understand the words. They saw the light. It knocked them off their horses. But God had a special message for Paul. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, and stand upon thy feet. In other words, quit sitting around. i got a job for you to do. I've told you who I am. Now get up. Don't lie there. Don't lollygag. Don't worry about it. Quit thinking about it. Quit wondering what you ought to do. I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. Rise, stand on thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. What's Paul doing in court? He's witnessing in court. God said, this is the purpose I have for your life. This is what I'm going to do with you. He'd already told the other 11 that's what they're going to do. They're going to be his witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What has he called us to do? Lounge around and wait for somebody else to go? Lollygag while we're watching TV and popping grapes? He's called us to be witnesses. Not wait for somebody else to do it. He's called us to be witnesses. When was the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus Christ? Somebody who was unsaved. Somebody who was lost as a rock and headed for hell. Were you bold in it? Did you pray with them passionately to please trust Christ? They're lost. You are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. God reached down and grabbed Paul by the scruff of the neck because Paul was going the wrong way. You and I have been sort of sauntering along the right way, but not doing our job. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, 
both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. When was the last time you talked to somebody and they said, wow, I never saw that before in the Bible. I had that privilege on several occasions when I was overseas just these last five weeks. Wow, I never knew that was there. From some unbelievers who had never understood the grace of God. from some unbelievers who clearly the Holy Spirit was working on their hearts, convicting them of sin. When was the last time you spoke to someone about the gospel outside the periphery of this property? to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. Do you really believe that unsaved people are under the power of Satan? They are. Haven't you been called to a rescue mission? If you saw someone tied to a chair in a burning building, would you say, well, I hope somebody goes in there to rescue them? I hope that the ropes burn off before they burn to death. Would you not feel compelled to try to save their life? If you saw a truck coming down the road about to hit a child and you could reach the child and pull him out of the way, would you not do it? All around us, people are in darkness. All around us, people are under the power of Satan. All around us, there are people whose sins have not yet been forgiven. Do you not want to see them forgiven? Do you not want them to be a trophy of grace in heaven? Do you not want the rewards that God offers? That they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. We talked about the doctrine of sanctification as well as salvation is intimately connected to faith. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul was doing his job. He didn't stop with one success. He didn't stop with two successes. He didn't stop with locality that was close to him. He kept moving out and out and further out and further out and further out because he had good news by which people could be saved. I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Genuine faith is always connected to repentance for sin. It's not connected to sweeping sin under the rug. It's not connected to thinking, oh, well, you know, let bygones be bygones. I still got a little bit of that in here, but you know, I like to keep it. It's sort of comfortable. It's, uh, it's territory. I already know that sin stuff. Repentance. Turning away from it and turning toward God. That's how you become an effective witness for Jesus. If you still hang on to the old sins, you will not be an effective witness. Because people will see the old sins, they won't see Jesus. They'll see the old way of life, they won't see Jesus. They'll see the old habits, they won't see Jesus. No matter how hard you try to talk to them about it, what they see is the areas of compromise in your life that you refuse to give up. 
that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet or fitting for repentance. Genuine repentance is life-changing. You can talk till you're blue in the face and bat your gums until your teeth fall out, but if there is no change in your life, your lips make no difference. Because it made a difference, what happened? Verse 21, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. You see, Paul had a transformed life. That's the last thing he's talked about before he tells us this. Paul repented. He changed his direction. He gave up all that stuff that he'd been getting into and really being applauded for by the Jews. His life changed. For these causes the Jews went about to kill me, says he. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing. Oh, there we have it again. What's Paul doing in court? One word begins with a W. Let's say it together. Witnessing. Let's say it again. Witnessing. Let me hear you say it without me. All right. Did he distinguish those to whom he would witness and say, well, I'll only take this group of people because they're the easy targets. He says, witnessing both the small and great. And you know, his message was consistent. He didn't change his message. He didn't alter it. He didn't enhance it. He didn't denigrate it. Saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. He stuck to the scriptures. Most of the New Testament was not written at the time that Paul is speaking here to King Agrippa. The Old Testament was there. And he witnessed about Jesus from the Old Testament. We've talked about that in great detail here in the past. You remember I did an entire series on Christ in all the scriptures? Do you remember that? We went through every book of the Old Testament and found multiple references to Jesus in every book of the Old Testament. How many of you remember that series? Good, a few of you remember that. If I asked you, can you point to Jesus in Habakkuk? How many of you could say, yes, I know there's a verse about that in Habakkuk? You ought to at least know Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. If you don't know that, look it up. How about if I said, can you point to Jesus in Obadiah? Can you point to Jesus even in, say, Ezekiel? How about in Zechariah or Zephaniah or Haggai or Malachi? Christ in all the scriptures. The Apostle Paul didn't have to have written the New Testament yet. He didn't have to have the writings of Peter. He didn't have to have the writings of John. He said, I say nothing other than those things which prophets and Moses did say should come. And here's what he focused on. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Death, burial, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. That's what Paul says is the heart of the gospel. Romans 1, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul was witnessing, sharing the gospel of Christ. That principal thing, it's always the appropriate thing, and it's always the first thing in every situation. Never forget that when you're tempted to compromise. Never forget that when it's politically correct to keep your mouth shut. Someday and perhaps soon some of us here may be dragged into court for taking a biblical stand for Christ. Don't be surprised. God will give you what to say. Jesus promised it. Mark chapter 13 beginning in verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, 
and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son. It's hard for us to imagine. And children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Jesus is telling them, witness your heart out, and when they drag you to court, God will give you what to say. It could happen very soon in this country, folks. Are you ready for it? Never forget that your principal responsibility is to witness in every context. Here we have a legal setting, so we obviously are to witness in legal settings in business settings, in social settings, in family settings, in academic settings, in shopping settings, in interpersonal relationship, in writing letters to unsaved friends, in talking on the phone, in sending an email or a text message. You are, whether you like it or not, a living epistle known and read by all because the Bible says so. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You are the epistles of Christ. And you are read by everybody with whom you come in contact every day. You are a living epistle. And that's why the devil wants so bad to destroy your testimony. That's why he wants so bad to write things in between the lines. Why he wants so bad to obliterate parts of the sentences in your life that would testify to Christ. Because you're a living epistle. And if he can, that's why he wants to burn you. Because you're a living epistle. The reason this is important is that men and women and boys and girls are lost. And you may be the only presentation of the gospel that they will ever hear. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. <coughs> we just read verse 3. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You're a living epistle. Satan doesn't like it. He's going to try to blunt your witness. But remember, you have nothing to be ashamed of. And you have every motive for witnessing. That's what Paul says in Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He writes in chapter 5 of Romans, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. That's what makes us a living epistle. but it means you're going to suffer. 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. When you're faced with the ridicule and the scorn and the laughing of the people with whom you want to share Jesus. Are you ashamed? Do you sort of taper off in your sentence because you see they're already grinning and nudging one another? Paul suffered more than that. Wherefore, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed for I know, not I think, not I hope, not I guess. I know whom I have believed. Do you have an intimate, 
personal walk with Jesus every day so that you can say I know not what I have believed I know whom I have believed it's not knowing about Jesus it's knowing Jesus really knowing Jesus in the closest most personal intimate way of best friend when you know someone as best friend when you know what they're really like when you know they're perfect you're not ashamed to tell others about them I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day he will never let you down do you believe it do you really believe that he will never let you down then why aren't you witnessing Paul has much to teach us about what it means to know Jesus because it changed his life I think this much is clear if you're ashamed of Jesus when the going is easy or if you're ashamed of believers who are suffering for their faith when things are easy you will definitely be ashamed of Jesus when the going gets tough now is the time to stand with believers who are suffering for their faith and then you will be unashamed to stand for Christ when the going gets really tough we have an illustration of that over in 2 Timothy 1 16 the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Onesiphorus could have kept himself squeaky clean by never going to prison and seeing the Apostle Paul. After all, he wouldn't have wanted to raise questions about himself. I mean, if Paul's in jail for being a Christian, if Paul's in jail for preaching the resurrection, if Paul's in jail for believing the resurrection, ooh, isn't that kind of a scary thing for Onesiphorus? Or wouldn't it be kind of like, ooh, I don't want anybody to see me down here because they might say, you know, I bet that guy's a Christian too. Look, he's taking care of Paul. Onesiphorus often refreshed Paul and was not ashamed of his chain. If you're ashamed of other believers who are suffering for their faith, if you don't immediately stand up with them and by them and say, I believe that too, what makes you think that you would stand for Jesus when you're by yourself? Just remember, if you're ashamed of Jesus, he will also be ashamed of you. But if you're faithful, he will never be ashamed of you. Scripture says so. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That was Mark 8.38. Listen to Luke 9.26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's and the holy angels. But if, on the other hand, you're faithful in your witness, you're faithful in your spiritual growth, you're always delighted to tell others about Jesus, you're growing to spiritual maturity. God will be delighted to own you as his children. Hebrews 2.11 For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you want Jesus to be ashamed of you? Or do you want him to be so unashamed of you he calls you his brother? Hebrews 11.16 speaking of the heroes of faith but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly 
Their focus is on eternal things, not on temporal things. They care about Christ. They don't care about junk. They desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Do you know why it's a dangerous thing to be ashamed of Christ? And why Paul was never ashamed of Jesus Christ? Why he exhorted Timothy never to be ashamed of Christ. Why he exhorted Titus never to be ashamed of Christ. Why he exhorted the believers all the way through the book of Acts never to be ashamed of Christ. Why when he was on the, the hot seat, he was not ashamed of Christ. Do you know why? He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Do you get any overtones about the resurrection there? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. There's pain and suffering, but there's also great reward. Now listen to this phrase. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Do you think there's some serious issues involved here? Do you think there might be a test to weed out the chaff from the wheat? To see who are the professors versus those who are the possessors. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Whether you believe or don't believe, he's consistent. He does not change. He does not morph like a transformer into something else. He is still who he is. He cannot deny himself. Your greatest blessing, as well as your protection, back to our theme, your greatest blessing, as well as your greatest protection, is to be a witness wherever you are even if you have to appear in a court of law to do it. Remember, your testimony becomes a permanent record of the trial court. Did you know that? Trial court records are permanent records. It must also be read by the various courts of appeal. Who knows? The record of your trial might be the permanent written record that leads someone to Christ years from now. You've heard me talk about Christian last wills and testaments because that becomes a permanent record in the court. And it's read by the judge. And it's read by the clerks. And it's read by people doing genealogical research and others who have to file it. And you being dead will yet speak, as did Abel in Hebrews 11. Same thing is true of your trial records. The stenographer has to hear it. The plaintiff, the bailiff, the judge, the witnesses in the audience all have to hear your testimony. Make it count. Paul did. What are you doing with the doctrines of Scripture? What are you doing with the person and work of Christ? Is your testimony making a difference? Because someday both you and I will have to give an account. Our gracious Heavenly Father, teach us how to be witnesses. Paul was being a witness in perhaps one of the most difficult of all situations. He was witnessing in court. He didn't pull any punches. He didn't try to change the subject. 
He didn't try to appeal to the ego and vanity of the kings to let him off because, after all, the Jews were doing something totally criminal and illegal. He witnessed. The most important thing in the world for Paul was witnessing, telling others about Jesus, who he is, what he had done, his great and precious promises, and the life that he gives to all who believe. Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you might use it in our hearts to stimulate us, to motivate us, to empower us, to challenge us, to grab us by the scruff of the neck as you did with the Apostle Paul and tell us to get up and stand on our feet because you have called us to be your witnesses. And you will go with us wherever we go. Father, we pray that you will help our lives to count for Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening.